someone who's better looking is perceived as more virtuous. Is that, is that called the halo effect? No, the halo effect is when I run up to you with a rifle and I butt you in Xbox Live. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the halo effect. All right, cool. All right, you ready? Yeah, man. Cool. All right, all right. Derek, yeah. welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, Rex. Cool. Thank you very much for doing this, by the way. Yeah, no problem, man. Right. Is this camera recording? Because last time I forgot to uh, hit it was the record. recording. Yeah. Okay, we're good to go. All right. Whew. All right. So, um, thank you for coming on. And what sparked this invite was you actually said something to me about like a week or two ago. It yeah. was about two weeks ago. Yeah. That really got me thinking. I'm like, huh. I kind of want to talk to Derek more a little bit more about this. Okay. Which is that uh, you said. Um, you said. It's in, it's, you said something along the lines of, it's in, it's in our best interests as human beings to make men as dangerous as possible. Mm -hmm. And, and I kind of want to start there. Okay. Well, before we start there, who are you? What do you do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Derek Tucker. Um, I essentially do sales. I'm, I'm going keep, to keep it, keep it at that. Okay. Uh, I'm, in the, I'm in the tech industry, um, not technical myself. Mm -hmm. But yeah, man, you know, I went to school for philosophy psychology. I've been reading this stuff since I was like, uh, reading about philosophy and psychology since I was, you know, 14, 15, been talking about this stuff equally as long, as ridiculous as that sounds. Um, yeah, it's kind of uh, something that I, I care a lot about and I think a lot about. Okay, awesome. Yeah. And, and you're so a jiu-jitsu guy. Yeah, yeah, I love jiu-jitsu. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Right. I'm very bad at it, but I love it. <laughs> I love it. Hey, hey uh, j uh, being bad at jiu-jitsu means you're better than 99% of everyone yeah, else who just, doesn't do just it. Just get on the mats. There you go. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So let's uh, let's start at the uh, at the quote. Sure. Sure. I mean, it's, obvi it's obviously related to Jordan Peterson's kind of philosophy, right? Where a dangerous man is um, well, a virtuous man is a dangerous man who chooses not to be. Um, it just when when I when I look at how uh, people navigate the world. It appears to me that an unafraid person often becomes. Um, there's, a, I think, there's a lot of negative negative personality traits, personality development for a person who does not have at least some low level of anxiety or uh, motivating fear. And you can see that in some respects with um, with the way that men interact, right? Like it's very well known that there's always a low level threat of violence when, when men interact. And it's, it's, that's why we don't walk around running our mouths off. That's why we don't walk around saying inappropriate things to one another. That's why we don't walk, walk around posturing 24 seven. And the men who do that usually look like idiots. Mm -hmm. um, Unless we're good friends with each other. Yeah, then, then, well, I mean, then we just give each other shit all day but long. There's, but there's a tone to that, right? There's a tone to that. And, there, and usually violence isn't in the picture. And it just appears to me that the relationships, the, it appears to me that the personality, the person, the person, the people who develop with some level of motivating fear and anxiety often focus on um, increasing value and producing value in themselves rather than, than the opposite. When you have a person who lacks fear, you, you, you get people who become very arrogant, very egotistical, narcissistic. You get laziness, right, gluttony, fear of health issues, fear of success. You know, a fear of not succeeding. Like these sort of things are that you, you need. You need. To, you need to be motivated to be a better person. In my opinion. My opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when you look at the broader world, it's not a safe place. It never has been a safe place. And I think understanding the capacity for violence. If we're going to get down to it under, and, and get to the heart of it, a man's ability to understand his capacity for violence will inform the way he interacts with the world. And um, go, go into that a little bit more. Um, and this goes into like Young, you know, and I was like Jordan Peterson, right? Like I, I've, read, I've, read, I've read some Young before I even heard of Jordan Peterson, before Jordan Peterson was around. And there is the, like, the archetype of the shadow. And, there, and there's a number of other, uh, other writing, right? You have uh, Nietzsche, he, he dives into it. The whole existentialist movement dives, dives into like the, the aspect of despair, violence, you know, whatever, whatever that may be. And when you're able to understand your capacity for evil, you can empathize with people who are in pain a lot easier. Mm. Because if you're able to, if you know you have the capacity to essentially hurt someone very, very seriously physically, or you've experienced that yourself, it gives you, um, I think, a better frame of reference for, for the reality of the, of the situation you're in. 
Um, if you know you have the capacity to do X, Y, and Z when some big guy comes at you or some, or some guy running his mouth comes at you, you can say, oh, well, I know I understand that he's hurt. I understand that how, you know, why he's doing this or why he's latching out. And there's a confidence to it as well. Um, so it, it just seems to me that, it seems to me that when you can inf inform the way that you in navigate the world with the fact that you can be as equally detestable as the next person who you detest, that it gives it gives you some um, it gives you the ability to frame to frame the way you interact with more compassion, more empathy, more understanding. Um, and these are not traits necessarily that I think are the most like the highest pinnacle of, of you know virtuosity or whatever you want to call it. But um, it seems to me there is a deep value in being informed on a personal level about yourself that can help you navigate the world and achieve the goals you want. Um, more clearly, and it help you define help you define your place in the world a little more clearly too. Hmm. So I want to go into a little bit more about the uh, the, the fearless people aspect because yeah. um, because uh, one of the things that a lot of people like they uh, that the narrative that they feed to themselves that that like kind of like that TV show is going to feed to people is that you know like uh, uh, fear is what holds you back, fear is what like mm -hmm. limits you, and then you know y you have to be able to uh, act without fear, and that's how you be. Mm -hmm how you get to the next level and I see you, sh I see you shaking your head yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah, I, I still don't agree with that. Um, I think if a person actually they have no fear, they're just completely bullshitting themselves and they're, they're just not being authentic. So is it that they have fear and they don't recognize that they have fear or? or yeah, I think it's or, kind of... Or is it just like the ignorant person is, uh, is unaware of what th they should be fearful about? Th that's a good question. It's probably, probably a little bit of everything. Um, I think they're probably... And I guess an ex example is, right, we don't think about this in our daily lives, but there is a very real fear that at any point in time, most of us can, can be hum become homeless yes. and helpless. Like, there, there is a, re a really big fear that, at least as a man, that you could end up on the streets if you don't perform. So we don't walk around, we don't walk around thinking about that, but in times where we have extreme difficulty, we need to be able to lean on that fear and realize it's very real and use it to, to motivate us further. Um, I think there is a healthy, there's, there's different types of fear, right, if we're, if we're really going to go into it. So you don't want to sit around and go, oh, um, I can't do that because I'm afraid of what will happen if I do that. You can't do that necessarily. You should, the, the, the fear needs to be framed in a healthy context. Um, so it needs to be like, what is, the, what is the consequence of me not doing this? And you can do something like asking for a raise as an example, right? Like, oh yeah, you might be, have had the fear of asking for a raise. What if he fires me? What if you find someone to replace me? What if I'm not worth it? Yeah, you know, if you don't act on that, that's going to hold you back very clearly. Um, but what if you don't act on it, man? You know, like, what if you don't make that decision? What, what, what happens if you could have gotten something out of it and you didn't? Um, and, and that fear, I think, can be overcome by confidence in navigating hardship. If you know that by asking for a job, you might lose, you're asking for a raise, you might lose your job, you might be pushed out, whatever that fear is. If you already know you're going to be fine or that you can operate um, and find a new job, if you know that you can, uh, you have, let's say, the planning aside to where you can survive a month or two, if you just have confidence in the, in the worst case scenario for asking for that raise, then it's, the, the fear is minimized. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where like being involved in hardship and struggle and pain and violence, all these sort of things, they can, they can help reinforce the positive direction in your life. Um, so like, and you, can be you, can, and you can be afraid that, you know, hey, you know, it's not very pleasant. I'll give you an example. When, when personal example, when COVID hit, I lived in, I lived in Philadelphia. Um, I might have already told you this, Rex, but uh, I, I spent years doing a 100% commission sales job uh, building up a book, uh, you know, I wasn't like in the all star, but I'd made it to like top earners trips and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had a rough year. And coming out of that rough year was um, like in 2019, early 2020. And then the lockdowns hit, and I lost like thirty thirty thousand dollars in my pocket in like a two minute phone call. Ooh. I was on track for like a near near two hundred k year for my first, like my it was gonna be like my breakout breakout year, and that that destroyed me. You know, I didn't do very well with that. Um, you know, the whole, I don't think the whole world did really at that point in time. No one was really doing great. Uh, COVID was crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah, no one was really doing great. Um, but I knew that I'd find a new job um, because I knew that I wasn't going to sit around and take this. I was going to put myself in a different, situ uh, different situation. I wasn't going to let, let that happen. So now I'm not making the money I thought I was going to make. You know, this is a huge hit, right? My job's uncertain. Everything around, everything is just crazy. 
And for me, the decision I made was that the consequence in staying put was much worse than taking a chance. I took a job, I interviewed and took a job down here in Florida, never even video chatting my boss. It was two phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, I took an apartment never seeing it. I spent most of, most of the money I had in my back pocket at the time, not man, most, most of it, um, and I packed my car, paid someone and drove my crap down here. Um, and I started over, no friends or family in the area. I had like friends who were like acquaintances, but I had no, t no ties to the area. I was all alone, new job, new state, started my entire sales book over. Um, and there's a lot of different ways I think that fear could, could prevent you from, the, f the fear could have kept me in place. What happens if I move and things go wrong? I have no one there with me. You know, the, the fear could have kept me in place, but the fear also motivated me. I, I, was, I was terrified about what would happen if I, if I didn't take direct action and, and gain some more control over uh, my well-being. And along with that also came other things, right? It became, I became uh, quite uh, an unhealthy eater and getting a slob. You know, I blew up to like 170. I'm, I'm like 140 now. Well, yeah, I'm a small guy. It's like five, five, seven. So that's, that's that's a heavy weight. Lost a bunch of that weight. I got down here. I just reformatted my entire life. Reprioritized everything. I still have some friends from back home um, who I get like my close friends. My close friends. I'm gonna be a groomsman. Um, but I instead of sitting around and like being all um, pissy, and instead of being a little baby about things and being uh, upset and afraid. Oh my God, I'm paralyzed. I'm, I'm paralyzed by the fear. Um, you use the fear to take action because you know. The evil, evil, the most bravest, and this is so cliche, but the bravest people on the planet still feel, feel, feel fear, right? Yeah. Still feel fear. Um, it's just about acting in the face of the fear. Mm. You know. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. So, <coughs> so, uh, so, so it's not so much about being. Uh, well, why is this aimed that way? <laughs> I just whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'll figure. I'll play with the lighting when I edit it. Um, all right, all right so, so, so it's not so much about just uh, being fearless, it's just about that, uh, but recognizing where you are, what your position is, and what your options are gonna be, and where things are going to line up, and having the ability, ability to have that foresight to move forward despite all the obstacles that you're seeing in place. Yeah, and I think you can, if I want to back up to the original, original question, you wanted to say, you know, like, why, why would I say that a fearless person doesn't develop positive traits in that, in that sort of direction? Yes. Um, so I'll clarify, everybody feels fear in some context. I think there are different varieties of fear and different types of fear. I think that men manifest fear in different ways than women. Um, women often will lean on anxiety, whereas a, def a man's default is going to be anger. Mm -hmm. And there's often times a man's fear can, can, can be, can be um, created in anger. So e even using that paradigm, let's say that, that, a, that a, uh, a, man feel, a man is fearless, he's gonna put himself in situations where he is not, if a person is, is fearless to the extent they can be fearless or, they're fearless, or they're, they feel fear in an unhealthy way, they don't feel the constructive pressure to make positive changes. So uh, the, my example is, is, the, is, is what I would use for that. It's, you know, you, can, you have to frame the fear in a way that's healthy. Oftentimes you can just look at fear of, of like someone might have the fear of not being the greatest. Right, and that's kind of a different type of fear, but it's definitely not always the healthiest fear. I met some people who uh, who were legitimately afraid of that. Actually. Yeah, at the gym that I used to train at, this is one kid who he was he was 19 years old, and he's like, he, and he kept saying that he has to be the next Conor McGregor, or he or or, or he's going to kill himself. And we're like, yeah, dude, dude, bro, bro, like, yo, it's not that serious. And he's like, you guys don't understand how serious I have to take this. Yeah. It's life and death for me. And I was like. I, and I never knew what to say to him, just yeah. because. It was and, he, and he disappeared, didn't he? Uh, uh, n I don't know, because uh, he might still be there. I don't yeah. know, because he was there when I left, because this was up in Maryland. Oh, OK. Yes, yeah, so I don't know if, he, if he's still there or not, but it was pretty wild. I, I, didn't, I didn't understand what was going on there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and, and I can't even really wrap my head around something along those lines. I mean, there's very clearly some inadequacy or some major traumatic event that happened in his life that's motivating towards that. Oh, 100%, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it, you can see, like, if we're talking about this, this fear, this fear of not being great, you can, you, you can, you can see it's, it's created a lot of weak men. It's men who will act just for power's sake, right? It's, it's just, it, it's hard for me to articulate exactly what I'm thinking, but I can give you examples of it. So when you when you look at some of the leadership we have in the world right now, you see men who are very clearly, and women, who are very clearly afraid of not being great. 
Um, and you can look at how that drives their need to consolidate power and control the way the narrative flows. Do you have any you, examples? Yeah, I mean, I think Trudeau is one of them. Okay. I think that you can look at the leadership in New Zealand. I forget the woman's name in New Zealand. Um, I think that you could, uh, anywhere in politics you see extreme denialism. I think it falls in line with kind of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. When you see people who are unable to approach their own flaws, when you see people who are unable to say I'm wrong and correct ship, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, and look, I'll, I'll, I think, I think kind of like Joe Biden and that administration falls into it because it, through everything that's going on, I don't care how you feel about Joe Biden, whether you vote for one, it doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. But the way, if you have to look at the way that these people, and these are, this, I think most politics are like this, politicians are like this. I think I, when I talk about Joe Biden, I'm talking about the Mono Party. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the, 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 um, the establishment politicians who, who are lifelong politicians. They have no other expertise outside of power and politics. And if you, and if you look, the it's just incredible the inability to approach a problem at its root source if it in any way implicates some behavior that you've had like and, and you see that throughout all politics but if you look at the administration now you can inflation's one of them the housing market i mean the covid response i mean it's just it's endless and if they admit to themselves that they were wrong it's almost like denying their greatness and it's almost like an existential it's almost an existential issue for them. It's a matter of like life or death or existence like that man, you know. Um, and that, that goes like, it just, it, it, it seems to me that, I'm saying that quite a lot, that, that phrase, but I think that that sort of behavior is a direct reflection of something like an unhealthy fear of not being great or not being remembered well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, yeah, I, I just think that that sort of behavior is kind of derivative of what I'm talking about. I'm having trouble articulating exactly what I mean. I think the intuition is there, mm -hmm. but it's it's hard for me to put it into words exactly. Okay. Uh, I mean, so, uh, I mean, one of the things I did wanted to talk to you about is like this whole narrative that people are, uh, that, that's been circulating around for a little while now about the uh, demasculation of the modern day men and mm -hmm. uh, the effects that's having on society. And like, and we're, like, I want to know, like, where, where do you think it comes from? What's going on here? Yeah. Is, is it even something that's actually happening? Should yeah. we be worried about it? So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely happening, and and I'm saying this is not the most masculine man, right? I understand that I'm not like the macho man, uh, Randy Randy Savage <laughs> type. Um, yeah, uh, you, uh, you're you're a martial artist. Yeah, you should, well, you uh, know, I I've, I've, I've masculine personality traits for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think when we talk about like the masculine and the feminine, as far as as far as like, um, I think we're talking about talking about personality types and personality indicators more than an actual um, I would not want to talk about I would not want to have this conversation as if um, fem typically feminine traits and typically masculine traits mm -hmm. are, are are I wouldn't want to speak about them as if they are completely isolated in their own environment they're over no, absolutely they're, not. they're, they're, they're by bi they're bimodal yeah. right so there's two and I think bimodal is the right word there's, there's points at two end where most people reside, but there is a gradient in the middle. And that's why I think we're talking more about personality traits and, and, and personality distributions um, more, more than anything else. But I think it goes back to one, th one aspect of our culture that I've been thinking about quite a lot, and, I, and it's always been hard for me to, to explain it completely correctly. But we can look at, Women are born with value, men create value. I think that's pretty easy to, in my opinion, easy to see. W women are born with value, men create the value. Create their own value, right? Interesting. So men are born with the burden of performance. And you can see that um, with how casually we throw away men's lives in war, right? Men do the most dangerous jobs. Um, and you can see that in the mating strategy between men and women, right? M women don't want some bum. Yeah. They don't want a slob. Um, Overwhelmingly, women uh, are attracted to, to very similar things, um, and they all will go after the same men. So, and those, it's usually like status, power, resources. Um, there's also the physical physical dominance. Like these are all things you see. Um, when you look at how modern culture talks to women, what they're being told is that the male mode of being is superior to the female mode of being. They're not being told to embrace femininity, to embrace their own their own their own value that their own value, right? They, mm -hmm. they give life. That's it. That's incredible, right? And that's not all women are worth. I'm not saying that. 
but, I'm, but I am saying that there is a, a natural a natural um, a natural value to femininity in, in being born a woman. There's just a natural inherent value that men do not have. And when you tell a woman that uh, a, that the way that they have a successful life is by va judging their life in the same way that a man judges his life, aka success, right? Um, that you are an essentially telling women that the natural the, the natural female mode of being is inferior to the natural male mode of being and well, that's not even close to being accurate as to how the world functions no it's not it's not but and, and the the reason why I even bring that up is because it's been shown and I don't can't cite studies and I'm not all that good of a memory but you can find the studies that show that there are certain sociological circumstances in which women will cr create more testosterone naturally and their hormonal profile changes and in response to female hormonal profiles changing male hormonal profiles change Absolutely. because females lead the dating strategy they're the sexual selectors men 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 uh, choose men choose who to give commitment to women choose who to give sexual access to um, that's why you have the woman who, oh, you know, there's, there's always like that, the trope of the woman asking the man, can we have the conversation, can we talk, can we talk, mm -hmm. you know, or when are we gonna get married? You know? So when you, are, when, you tell women the, when you tell women as a whole that the, that the male mode of being is superior to, to their natural mode of being, you change the way they interact in the, in the world and the sexual marketplace. So that's when you have mm -hmm. Uh, like the strong independent woman uh, phenomenon, I say phenomenon, I don't know what you call it, the strong independent woman trope. Mm -hmm. You have the bad bitch trope, right? You have all this stuff. The boss and bitch. The boss bitch, right? And, the, and all these are telling women to be more masculine, to, to behave in a way that a man would behave. And when you do that, it changes the way that men respond sexually. So you, one example of this is the, the male feminist. It's a new dating strategy, it's a new strategy by being, um, by agreeing that men are trash or by by uh, being submissive to women and propping women up um, the reason why men, the men are doing that is because they're hoping to get laid yeah it's just why it's the only reason why they're doing it yes so when when men become more submissive th their own hormonal profile changes further so as the culture creates an atmosphere of uh, deference and submissiveness we have to realize we're biological machines that in our hormones and our brain chemistry respond to the environment around us in these ways. So you've, I, I think there's also, yeah. So I think there's also things like birth control. I'm, I'm pro birth control. But the pill changes a woman's hormones in a way that, that they interact with male pheromones differently. And the males interact with the female pheromones differently. So that completely changes the way our hormonal profiles interact with each other. So that creates an imbalance. Um, you tell men to be, uh, you tell men to be more caring and understanding, da, 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 and then when they do that, you leave them. This is just the way that stats pan out with, with marriage and all this other stuff. Um, so there's been this overarching narrative of the dominant woman, and there's been this overarching narrative of the submission, submissive man, and, that, and that's, culturally that's okay, but there are, I guess it's okay for some people, right? You wanna find your balance, you wanna find who you fit best with. I'm not saying any, anything is right or wrong. But when you do that sort of thing and then you, and then you enforce it through sexual selection and in sexual uh, male dating strategies, it does alter hormonal profiles. Combine that with medication that, that's been developing, combine that with birth control, uh, com combine that with unhealthy lifestyles we have now. Because um, we, we know that increase, increased um, like BMI, right? The, the heavier you are, your body doesn't process testosterone properly, doesn't it? as a man. It doesn't ma manifest enough, te enough testosterone. It doesn't, um, you know, you don't regulate estrogen as well. Uh, we also, uh, I mean, there's, there's so much. We know that microplastics uh, cre create a dampening effect on testosterone. We know that certain chemicals in plastics reduce, uh, <laughs> reduce the, the size of, is or it's contributing to the reduction of the taint size in men, when they're, of, of, of uh, uh, boys when they're born or men when they're born. And taint size is directly correlated to, to penis size and, to, and to, to testosterone levels. And so there, it's, a, it's a combination of this, of, this of, of like scientific, pharmaceutical, dietary, cultural, um, but at the core of things, when you when you do when you when you tell when you tell the sexual select the gender that is in charge of sexual selection to be 
uh, that the way they the way they are successful in the, in life is to behave like uh, to, is to behave in a way that's antithetical to their biology. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and our hormones react to that, and our pheromones react to that because we're not just it's some easy machine to, to lube up. So I, I think it's a lot of things at once, and I'm not really diving deep into one different aspect because I don't have all the science in front of me. But uh, it's you a, there's a so lot of places. <laughs> yeah, th yeah. There's 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 so much going on with it. It's not not just one thing or two things. It's everything. I mean, and, then, and you could even look at uh, you could even look at the fact that um, you can look at dating apps, right? You can look at look at um, you can look at the way that we, we, we mate now, you can look at the way that we interact sexually now. And when you, the, pro, the byproduct of having these dating apps is, in, and Instagram in my opinion is the largest dating app, is that women have wider access to, to men, so they're sexual selectors. And because they have wider access to men, they now think there's a larger pool of these top men that they're trying to out access. So they're neglecting the men at the bottom because now they go, oh, I have 300 guys who are sevens, eights, and nines. I'm a five. I don't need to look at those 2,000 guys who are six, fives, fours, whatever it may be. Um, so it essentially has the side effect of weeding the, the men at the bottom of the barrel, or however you want to describe it, out of the, the, the dating process as a whole. And you can see that reflected in virginity uh, statistics. So uh, between the ages of eight and 18 and 30, um, on average, I think the last time I looked, it was like 26% of men in those in that age range are virgins. Yeah. Now, when you look at females, it's still steady. It's still below. It's like below 10%. It's like eight eight percent. And it's and it usually about rotates between like I think it was like eight and 12 on the female side in that age group. So what that tells you is that the women are just sleeping up, sleeping up. They're sleeping with men in their young 30s because they have more resources. They can take you on their boat, their car, their house. You know. Um, so when a man feels, or a boy, or you know, whatever you want to call them at that age, feels helpless, or feels like they don't have a chance in the sexual marketplace, they just stop trying. That's when they get fatter, that's when they get... So it's, and all these things, once again, play in testosterone, because testosterone, testo one of the testosterone's primary functions is to regulate sex sexual behavior, regulate sexual, um, the, the sexual, I guess, the biological uh, functions around, around sex. So when you don't have access to sex, you don't use that that system, and you don't use you don't have access to that circuitry in, in the same level that a natural man of that age would. It's going to burn out as well. I think it's I think most of the effeminate, effeminate, most of the feminization of men. I think you can blame it on culture a lot, but it's it's also just a lot of our our daily lives. It's just right. Obviously, the dating is a problem. You can you know that's that's an issue right now. The dating landscape is trash, and that's going to affect it. Um, but it's it's also like dietary lifestyle habits. We're teaching kids not to go play in the mud. We're teaching them to you know keep and stay inside, play your video games, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'm all over the place. But th these are these are all things I think about. And I think they're all contributing in some way. Mm, I'm not gonna lie, man. That was this is all very disheartening and very depressing. Yeah, sounding. It's, 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 like, it's, it's, it's pretty it's pretty black pill and stuff. But I think that what you what what keeps me my head above water. Is the fact that it doesn't always last, right? Things, yeah. times change, man. You know, like I don't, I don't have the best outlook on the future. I don't have the, like the most optimistic outlook. Um, but the, in my opinion, I think the nihilism is the point. I think that a lot of what's going on in the world, they want you to be hopeless. They, whether and I say they, I mean I think the byproduct of of the way the dating environment is. I think it's des I think that it is designed to prey on hopelessness. I think that it. Even if it's not, it manufactures hopelessness. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the way the politics is, even if they're, they're, I think their intention is hopelessness. But even if it's not, the byproduct is hopelessness. Um, let's we can look at, um, you can you can look at uh, the the state of, even look at stuff like the battles. I guess it's politics, but if you look at the way that even TV. TV is and movies are to me. It just it seems hopeless. Like it, and I I think that the culture as a whole is pressing down on us, trying to make us nihilistic and hopeless. And I think that give, that makes me very angry and spiteful. So I'm not going to be that way. I, I just I just reject it outright. I think it's really really um, I I resent the fact that I feel like the. Uh, I resent the fact that the human structures we have in place are trying to make me feel this way. I think it's I think it's mostly intentional. That was a really fascinating roller coaster that you just took me on, which is 
Uh, we, th we talked about the, femini the feminization of men. You said absolutely it's happening. You gave me like a thousand reasons. And, and there's more. Yeah, there's more. Uh, and, and there's more to the point where I'm feeling like, man, I'm in a lot of despair right now. Well, and, then, and then you tell me that, man, I'm in this despair too, but I'm also not. And I'm you, like... Well, you, you, you see it and you don't buy into it. Yeah. You see it and you don't buy into it. You, you say, I see what you're trying to do to me. Fuck off. I hate you. I'm never going to let you do this to me. Yeah. How dare you try to do this to me? I'm, yeah. I'm not, not, not buying into it. Um, that's just the way I am. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying fuck off and I'm walking away. Like, there's no way you're going to try to make me feel like everything is going to shit because that, it, like it is. But you know, you're not, you're not, not going to make me feel like this, we're never going to recover from this. Um, because the minute a person buys into the nihilism, mm -hmm. they give up. And, they, and when you give up, you become fat, addicted, and compliant. And that's all the people in power want. They want you fat, addicted, and compliant. They want you sick so that you rely on them. They want you poor and broke so you rely on them. They want you, uh, it's, it, and that, that's, and they want you docile, so they, they, they don't want you to be out there uh, throwing fists. They don't want you out there like learning to fight, learning to shoot, whatever it may be. And, and this comes down to, if this comes back kind of to the, why, why I talk about men should be violent. I think that the under, an, an implicit understanding of violence is critical to, for, for a man's understanding of masculinity. And I, don't, I, don't, I do not think violence is masculine. Mm -hmm. I think understanding that violence is a natural part of the world around us, and it's a part of your issue, and it, and it is um, a low-level threat as far as the daily interactions you have with people. I think that's really important to know. I mean, I, I've had people rough me. I mean, I'm a small guy. I've had people try to grab me in clubs and stuff. I've had people push me around. I've had people spit gum in my hair. Yeah. You know, like so. It, that, that was many years ago. But you know, I've had these things happen, and I think that um, in order to be a man. In, I, in order, in order to fit what I would consider a not be a man, but in order to fit a more traditional model of masculinity, I think an understanding of violence is is, is key. Just yeah. if 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 not only to understand what you are capable of as a, of a man, a, as a man, and mm -hmm. then in the dark sides of you. Yeah. No. Right on. Yeah. Um, part, it's one of the reasons why I, I train martial arts because. Yeah. Well, part of it is because you know I got I got my ass kicked a lot as a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> said, that's said, a lot of us. Said nine out of ten martial artists. Yeah, ever. yeah, that's a lot of us. Um. Uh, but, uh, but the other part is because like, there's not a lot of places I have to like really like get my aggression out. I hate going to the gym. I hate lifting weights. It's freaking boring to me. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. But like, but, like, like when I like, uh, but it's like when I, when I throw on the, bo the the boxing gloves and I start like throwing leg kicks and stuff. Like it feels very therapeutic to me. I'm like cool. I'm like being violent in a very well controlled space right now. And then like when I'm out on the streets, I'm like, I'm like I just look at these people. I'm like, yo. It's gonna sound kind of corny, but I'm, but I'm like, this must be how Batman, how Bruce Wayne feels. Like, I can be, I'm actually Batman, but these people don't know that, you know. It's, and that's and, and, and it's so extremely corny. I know. No, no, it's, it, it. it's the same thing as um, like dress for success, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of a cliche fa uh, phrase, but um, you feel better when you're wearing a suit. I used to wear a suit to work when I was a banker. I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. You, you know, it's and when you when you train that that tra the confidence translates to the way you hold yourself. And I'll tie back into like gender dynamics. Women are the sexual selectors. That confidence projects out, and it, it helps with your interactions with women. Um, if that's what you're into as a uh, into as as kind of a goal of yours, but women also like guys who are violent, or at least capable of violence in some capacity. That's why right. women like when you stand up for them, and when they when people are picking on them, and, and all mm -hmm. this other stuff. Um, and I mean, I think there's biological reasons for that, right? Like, is a super possessive uh, sociopath who is violent. Good at defending you and your family from dangers in the wild, right? Like this, this is, it's normal. It's normal part of our biology. Um, that's why, like the dark. I'm not sure we looked into it, like the dark triad thing with mating. How women tend to yeah. draw the dark, the dark triad: narcissism, sociopathy, and psycho psych psychopathy. Um, you know, they all have evolutionary roots, and I think that violence, once again, is another part of that. If, as a man, your goal is to have a healthy relationship with a woman, I think that you, I think that it will go a long way for you to uh, understand violence. So everything that you've been saying so far, are we eventually going to reach a point where the uh, the gender role swap, where the women become, are we going to become like the uh, the the big breadwinners, the the capable ones, and all the guys just become like completely all feminized and everything, and they stay at home dads? I mean, I guess the well, the stay home dad things I'm fine with, man. If that's the way your relationship works, I, I, it generally doesn't. The number one indicator of uh, divorce is when a woman makes more than a man, mm -hmm. um, by yeah. by a wide margin. That's the number one indicator of divorce. The top three reasons for divorce. Uh, are uh, man has a mental health episode, man loses his job, major uh, financial event. Women file for divorce between 78% of the time. Um, so I just don't think that's po the future you're describing. I don't think it's even possible. Okay. And I, and I just I think it's not possible because women are not attracted to those men. They're they're, they're they just it will not simply be. 
on top of that, plummeting in testosterone. So the the average testo the testosterone of an average young twenties man right now is the same as uh, what the testosterone for like a seventy something year old was years ago. Like our the, our testosterone levels are plummeting. It's bad. It's bad. Um, yeah, have you have you have you ever have you seen the way teenagers interact with each other these days? Have you actually got like have you gone to like a theme park and seen like a group of young boys and young girls together? Yeah, it's 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 really weird. I look at them all the time and, and I and, and and I see and I see the girls and I see the guys. The guys are like they're very skinny. They're scrawny and I'm well, like, the, have you noticed the power difference in the way they interact? Like, there's a huge there's yeah, a huge yeah, the, power difference. The, the girls run everything. Yeah, yeah, they control everything. They tell the guys to throw this yeah. cup out for me, and the guys like, okay. Oh, two, yeah, two, two yeah. bush garbage can. So when I, w when I was younger, the guys, all, not always, right? The girls make plans too, but it usually like the girls are coming to hang with us. It was like, yeah. oh, we're, we're going to do something. The girls come hang with us. And you talk even further back, it was even more solidified. It was kind of still, you know, I'm, I'm uh, yeah. millennial, millennial, just yeah. like 2007, yeah. I graduated. Yeah, it was always the, uh, the, uh, the, the guys hung around and the girls were just a part of it. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and, and I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with women leading things. That's not my, that's not my point. Mm -hmm. My point is that there is clearly something going wrong with the way that men and women interact with each other. It's just, it's, there's clearly something not not right there, and when I look at how how, how they inter young boys and in, in, I guess teens and interact with each other, to me it's just very shocking how far ahead the women are with uh, the young girls are with like their savviness, mm -hmm. um, the, an understanding the, a, a, their social understanding of their place. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. like. Um, and, I, and you, you can see the you can see the girls pull the strings and the boys just jump. Now I'm not sure if it's always been like that. I just didn't see it. You know, like I was I was a pretty uh, pretty soft kid in, in high school myself, but it just seems to be like the normal thing now, mm -hmm. and that kind of surprises me. Um, but all these things, I you know, I just don't I just don't think that that future is going to be possible. I just don't think that um, it will get to a point where where men will be basically sterile. If the testosterone will plum plummet too much, like you, you need to, do, men need to be uh, authoritative in some way. They need to be uh, stick to their guns and be strong and masculine. Um, I think a lack of exercise is a big part of that too. Like you know, squats are the big, biggest muscle group. Quads, yeah, video games, yeah. Mm -hmm. And look, I play too. Um, but I'm also like Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I train two hours each day. I lifted Monday as well. Trained mm -hmm. yesterday. Nice. You know, like that's nine hours. You know, mm -hmm. last. So you, you, the if I was going to have a have a son today, and I wanted to avoid this issue. If I had a son today, and he let's say he's old enough to understand what he understand that he's going into high school, and maybe he's not even puberty yet, puberty yet. I would I would make sure they were doing they were doing some martial martial arts just from from a very young age. Mm -hmm. uh, I would make sure they are always physically active. I don't care if they pick a sport or not. I, th I would encourage them, if not demand, they play at least one sport in high school. Uh, and I, and I, I mean, those are just the two things I think the most. I mean, that right there is going to help testosterone, testosterone mm -hmm. levels. It's going to help their, their masculinity. Um, and when you're not exercising, you're not being super active during puberty, your body reads that situation as if you don't need. Like, so your body's constantly trying to conserve energy. It's constantly trying to conserve resources. So if you're not being super active while you're going through puberty, your body's going to take it as like, oh, I don't need to be super active. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to waste the resources build, building it into a machine. It's going to stop you where it thinks you need to stop based on your activity. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's, it's not some process that just happens. Um, there, there, are, there are outside influences on how you develop. Um, so my goal as a parent of a young boy would be to have them get to that phase and navigate the biological transformation into a man as best as possible. That's outside personality traits. That means I just want them to be physically challenged that, until, that whole time. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to put them in a good physical place to, to find the woman they want to be with. Mm -hmm. Which I think is really how we solve a lot of these issues in general, is having a family. I was going to ask you, like, what do you think the solution to all this is? Yeah, having families. And, and you know, I'm 33, I'm late to the game, right? Like, um, and this is a part of it, right? We're not getting, we're not, we're getting, we're, we can't buy homes. We're not getting married young anymore. Uh, you know, children are expensive, inflation. So there's a lot of reasons why we're not doing these things, but ultimately, you just need to have a family, raise the kids to have your values and to realize how insane all this stuff is and push them out in the world the best you can and keep them go. I saw a poll recently that asked uh, uh, when the best time for, uh, for, for people to have kid, get married and have kids is in the overwhelming uh, age range that this poll reflected was in was uh, mid to late 30s. Yeah, that's psychotic. Uh, at age 35, 
pregnancy is diagnosed as ger geriatric pregnancy. So when a woman is pregnant at 35, it's considered a geriatric pregnancy. Mm -hmm. the, the, the rates of uh, genetic disorders skyrockets, physical, dis uh, physical disorders skyrockets, uh, the uh, miscarriage of skyrockets. I mean, it's exponential. It's not even like a small amount. Like when you get to 35, every single thing you're afraid of happening to your child just gets ramped up. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, this is a psychotic number. On the female side or the male side? Female side. Okay. For men, it doesn't matter as much. Yeah, we can poke around as much as we want until yeah. our <laughs> 60s. Yeah, yeah. Seventies um, even. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, look, it, it's unfair just the way it is, you know, and it wouldn't be like that if women weren't selecting men in the 30s and 40s and 50s who were older than them, mm -hmm. right? So, so, uh, uh, so women should be selecting older men then? I think that young women selecting older men are probably going to have better relationships. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you want my honest I advice, I think that both men and women need to stop sleeping with people they don't want to have kids with. I, th I think that's the. I think that's one of the biggest ways that we can self-correct the sexual marketplace. I think if men just stop fucking around uh, with women they don't want to have kids with, and if women do the same, I think this corrects in about five years. I think it's a fast, fast. But we're out. But men are out here running amok. You know, they're like they're fucking having a blast, right? We're, we're, we're in Florida. This is like a. We live in a giant orgy. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, and there's so many good-looking people here, right? It makes sense. Like, I get it, dudes are programmed to go bounce around, but they need to take some responsibility for their behavior. Mm. And they're, they're wondering why women are, like, they, they bitch and moan about this, like how the female narcissism, right? But it's, it comes down to the fact that they're pumping these women full of self, uh, self esteem and validation by sleeping with women they don't even want to give a shit about. They don't want to be with them. They wouldn't even see them. They, a lot of these guys run around sleeping with women they wouldn't even be seen in public with. Well, let's, let's be real about it. Mm -hmm. They're on Tinder, swipe, or whatever. They're, they're, they're sleeping with women they would not even be seen in public with. Mm -hmm. And, and that's just inexcusable. It's, it's doing like, extreme harm to, to, the, to the, the women they're with, it's doing extreme harm to themselves. We're essentially running around traumatizing ourselves. Everybody's traumatizing each other. It's like when, when you're stacking bodies 10 miles high, who's gonna get out of that sca scot free? Who's getting away from that scot free? You know, like, um, so I, I, I do think there are, this is why I'm not black pilled and nihilistic, right? There are, so, I can see solutions, you mm -hmm. know? And, and these are steps I'm taking in my own life as well, right? Like, like everything I'm saying here, I'm focusing on all myself. Um, I don't do dating apps anymore. They're one of the, one of the most self-destructive uh, periods of my life were dating apps. They were so toxic. So, so, so self-destructive. Um, I have, like I said, I've been losing a ton of weight. I'm not only training four to five days a week now, I'm also lifting on top of that. You look good. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking better. I'm looking oh, yeah. better. It's, it's one step at a time. Um, I'm watching my diet. I've, I've, uh, I've, Basically restarted my career. I didn't restart my career, but I, I I'd hopped careers. I did one job for a year that just didn't didn't turn out to be what it was sold. I took you know I took the job that me my me and my boss, and now I'm in a company. I took a chance. I uh, I was the first U.S. hire for a startup, mm -hmm. and that's you know I'm 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 walking the walk at least in my own personal life. Now I'm not back on the dating market yet. I'm I'm on time, um, but so the, are you like a MGTOW? No, I'm not a MGTOW. I'm not a MGTOW. <laughs> um, I, I walked away for a time. I don't feel like the dating market's in a healthy place. But I primarily walked away because I need to get myself straight. And I'm, I'm saying walk away, not in a permanent sense. But I, I, I had to walk away because after doing something like you know a year and a half long Tinder bender, it's just you know it scrambles your brain. It really does. It really does knock you out of whack, and it and it and it, it changes a lot about the way you view the world in a very unhealthy way. Um, and after that, it was I'm not how I, how am I even a, a good pick on the market? Mm -hmm. Like how am I even how can I reasonably accept someone? to think that I'm a correct choice. Mm -hmm. And and that's where the process started. You know, I moved down here, new job, let's try to get some money back up. Cause I was, like I said, I was about to make the best money of my life. And let's get some money back up. Let's get, we surround people who are constructive and healthy, not party all the time. And um, let me get my weight down, let me get my physical fitness up, let me get, get a healthy routine, let me, let, me, let me show that I have some sort of um, consistency and some willpower. and all these things that I just had, had lost track of over a period of about six, seven years, you know, from my young 20s after college through like my late 20s. Mm -hmm. And it was just time to get that shit back on track. So it wasn't that, it, the, the issue wasn't even the fact that I'm so, you know, black pilled about all this stuff with the dating market. It was that it's uh, how can I reasonably expect someone to pick me as a good choice that I would want to be with? 100%. Yeah. No, there's nothing that you just said that didn't make 100% yeah. sense. I'm on board with all of that. Because yeah. I'm actually on a similar journey myself where I remove myself from dating for, um, I I, I'm, I'm actually removing myself from dating for like a little while right now as I'm just going through like this healing process of 
going through some things that I'm going through with my personal life. Uh, yeah. I've been seeing a therapist just to get my good. mental health yeah, good. together. And and, and, and it, it's, it's fascinating because I told some people, hey, man, I'm seeing a therapist. They're like, oh, why are you seeing a therapist? You're not messed up. I'm like, no, I'm seeing a therapist. No, I'm not messed up right now because I'm seeing a therapist. Like yeah. Before, I was... I, I was actually this close to actually like driving my car into a forest and actually and and running a hose to the inside of my car yeah, yeah. and just just offing myself. I even yeah. I wrote I had a whole so, suicide's a bitch way out though, dude. It's a pussy way out. Uh, I, I thought about it too. I know. Yeah, I, I, I had a whole letter written out and everything. Mm -hmm. How to unlock my uh, unlock my computer, or cell phone, and everything. Um, but I, and then I realized, like, man, like I need to I need to start taking care of myself because if I don't take care of myself, like, how's anybody going to respect me? And, and it all starts with I have to respect myself and uh, you know uh, getting myself together, getting myself into shape, and just. Doing that, it's it's very interesting. Doing that on on its own has actually put more females into my life than I thought even mm. was possible, and I didn't even plan that. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of weird. No. Um, not to, not to make this into like a dating thing or whatever, because yeah, I'm yeah. still trying to not date. You know, if, if if the right woman comes along, you know, she comes along. But yeah, um, but yeah, I agree with everything you're saying. But. So, uh, so, uh, so one thing I do want to get you to uh, talk to you about them because you talked a lot about like the, the, the hormonal imbalances and everything yeah, that's yeah, going yeah. on, and it's how important it is, especially when you're, uh, like, like you said, if you, if you had a son in high school and you know, and which is like the craziest hormonal time in anyone's his, anyone's yeah, life. Be, yeah, you need to be pushing. Or you need to be pushing, pushing the, tr the the person going through puberty to have the most uh, ideal lifestyle. In my opinion, for their biological body, which which includes a lot of physical activity, a lot for men, yes, sports so yeah. of some sort. You know, I think women, I think women should be active as well. I don't think it's as important necessarily because their body works different, but I think that you yeah. know the same thing. So, how do you feel about this whole like this? There's this, this, this a certain group of people who are trying to stop, who are trying to stop kids from taking. They're trying to block their hormones. Yeah, yeah. And so they figure You're out what kind of gender they are. Yeah, yeah. And, and and all this crazy stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's not irreversible. It's I mean, it's not reversible. It's completely it's completely irreversible. In some situations, you develop different bone structures. You develop different muscular structures. Your body develops differently. And uh, the I'm not sure if you know this, but the pill they're giving people the kids to do this is called Lupron. It's chemical castration. Yeah, it's chemical castration. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. The, the original use for the pill was it's they gave pedophiles to, to in jails. Yeah, yeah, rapists in jails, so they couldn't get erections and. Um, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But it's the same one that they're, they're trying to give to like little thirteen-year-olds. Yeah, they, they are giving. They are they're in, in large quantities. And um, in, in my opinion, it, this is just a way for the uh, medical industrial complex to siphon more money out of the population. I think they're preying on people's. Uh, like I said, they want you mentally ill. They want you sick. So I think this is this is uh, the the medical industrial complex is in our in our common culture's way of exploiting um, vulnerable vulnerable people, vulnerable teens. I think there's just another mechanism to do that. It's the same way that California handles the homeless population. They act like they're trying to do stuff. Oh my God, we're gonna do all this stuff for homelessness, and then it just gets wor it's worse and worse and worse. Meanwhile, they're dumping five billion a year into it, and you know, it's just it's a it's a way for uh, it's a way for corporations and the government to siphon money out, out of people's pockets and, and put it into big corporations while exploiting their mental illness. Is it really a mental illness, though, I think, or, is, I think, or is it just like teens that are just being confused at certain things, like you're supposed yeah, to be? True, true. Yeah, I mean, depends. I'm, I'm, when I speak about this sort of stuff, I'm speaking more from the perspective of gender dysphoria. Okay. Um, but a, what, what a lot of data is showing now is that these kids who are transitioning often are diagnosed with autism or Asperger's. Mm -hmm. So a large portion of these of these teens, specifically, that are transitioning or using puberty blockers or at, 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 at that age, right? I'm not talking about adults. I'm talking about people who are like you know up to 18, maybe even like 19, 20, um, who are adults, but they're, uh, they're often autistic and they're socially, uh, socially awkward, awkward, they don't really understand their place, they're confused, you know, and, uh, and, and, and someone, walks, someone says, someone offers them a solution for validation and, and it, in my opinion it's a type of, there, there is grooming involved because if someone, if someone says I'm trans or I think I'm a woman, and, and and they're biological male, and everybody claps and laughs and jokes and like s celebrates. Yeah. What does that do? 
It's a re it's re it's positive it, social reinforcement. It, it tells them they're doing something right. Yeah, instead of going, well, how do you know this? What, what are you okay? Can I help you? Mm -hmm. If they just go affirm, 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 it's just it's positive validation, positive validation, positive validation, and 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 young kids are really really susceptible to positive validation. But they don't stand a chance. Yeah. So I'm not saying all people like I I'm, I'm very much uh, on the uh, I'm very much left wing on this issue, for the most part. Um, it's just the kids and the sports. That's what bothers me about it. And definitely don't get people fucking chemical castration drugs without telling them that's what it is. Yeah. Definitely don't do that. You know. Um, but yeah, my concern is mainly with the young kids. And I mean, there's you can look at Deborah So. Deborah So has done a um, has talked about this, and a woman wrote a book on it. She was he was she was on Rogan about spontaneous gender dysphoria. Yeah. Where entire groups of children are coming out as um, you know, non-binary, trans. And I say children, but they're teens. Yeah. As as um, you know, non-binary, trans, all at once. You know, the, there's like you know, 10, 15 kids will be you know, all of a sudden have gender to gender issues or identity issues, and that just doesn't track with what we know. These sorts of mental and how these sorts of mental, mental illnesses operate. It breaks mm -hmm. trends, so it's social contagion at that point. It's a lot of p cultural pressure, positive pressure. I don't fit in, so maybe I'm this. I don't fit in, so maybe I'm this. And I'd probably be more receptive. To the argument, that these kids just know they're just able to, just, to understand and articulate at a young age. They, they, have, they have some sort of uh, near dysphoria, and they're you know whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. I would be more compassionate and understanding of that argument if if that's if the people in that arena acknowledge detransitioners. If you acknowledge the de, the de, the desistance movement, the detransition movement, and you talk about this, I would be more sympathetic. But the the fact that that you want to quash quash the other side, and I and I've personally known and have been friends with people who are who are transgender, and like it's not, it's not like I don't know these people. Yeah, um, I've been in the New York club scene. I was in the New York club scene for a decade. You know, I've been around it. You see, it, you see a lot of stuff in the New York club scene. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, you know, so it's it's not. You know, it's for me. It's just be honest about the whole picture, and I'll be more receptive. But for now, I just don't feel like a lot. Of, I feel like we need to be really careful about what we what we tell young kids and teens. So, uh, so what kind of effect is this going to have? Like over the next 10, 15 years where all these kids are just growing up and they think that gender just, uh, they think that just every other person coming out as trans is a normal thing. I have been predicting a massive mental health crisis. Massive. And I'm not, like, we think we have one now. That's not what I mean. I think that it's going to get to, a, it's going to be uh, catastrophic. And I think we'll probably see a, see a couple of years of an epidemic of suicides. Um, more than a couple of years. I think that we're going to have an overlap because usually between the, between seven and ten years after transition is when um, after sex affirming surgery mm -hmm. is when trans individuals are the most suicidal. Seven to ten years after physical transition. After. After, and that's when Why? that that's when the well I don't know exactly because I, I the way because I'm not I'm not that person right yeah so what I imagine happens. Is they think when they transition, all the problems go away, and they find out the problems are still the problems because there's usually multiple underlying uh, issues that lead them to make that choice. Mm -hmm. um, no healthy person wants to do that to their body. It's just it's you know there's something going on, and uh, I'm compassionate to it. I think you should be able to do whatever you want. That's not my point. My point as is long, you, as long as you're an adult. Yeah, as long as you're an adult, and I think that you, I think that it, it it you know we talked about mental health. I think that. You should, if when you're going through when you're going through uh, tr transitioning, because there are many many trans people who are healthy after the transition. Many, many. Kelly Jenner is one of them. She actually you, is doing dude, very, and there's very a, well. There's a, a porn, a porn, a male, a male to fem uh, female to male porn star uh, who is who's going around talking about it right now. You know, Blair White and some other people as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I lost my train of thought a little bit here. But I think that a part of that transitioning process should be making sure that you're in therapy and doing some sort of mental mental hygiene, right? right. Some emotional hygiene. But I think that there's going to be a few things. I think we're going to see if there's some, in somewhere in that seven to ten year mark after this phenomenon, we're going to start seeing probably suicides. Um, I don't think John. I could be wrong. I don't think Johns Hopkins, the who pioneered uh, gender affirming surgery, I don't think they even do it anymore because they realized mm -hmm. it didn't have any effect on the on the suicide rate. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like a rate of like 43%, something crazy. It's like, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong, but it's like some insane number, right? It's like a really crazy number, attempt suicide at least, mm -hmm. and before or after. But I think we're gonna see another 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 layer of... of well, well, we're, we're already seeing that uh, suicides are actually on the rise in the trans community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, even in Thailand, like where, where being trans is like, like abso a, is like absolutely normal. Yeah, it's been normal for, for decades, yeah. decades and decades. Yeah, uh, even there, like uh, there, you, 
their suicide rates are actually on the rise as well amongst I know in, that. The, in the trans community. Yeah, I actually looked into it uh, recently because uh, because you know Thailand is is painted as like the land of smiles or you know even like trans people are welcomed. I'm like, but yeah. uh, that may be the case, but it doesn't change the fact that if you're depressed, you're depressed, and suicide is still a thing. As someone who's very very close with suicide myself personally, I deal with it personally. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I, I, lo I lost uh, a parent to it. Yeah, so like you know, you know, so, uh, so I looked into it. And I'm like, no, actually, suicide is actually on the rise in trans communities worldwide. That's pretty interesting. I, 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 as the movement gains more and more traction, you would think that uh, being that more the, accepted. Yeah, yeah, th that they're being more accepted. That they're uh, that the suicide rate will go down, the mental health rate will go down. We're actually seeing the opposite effect as yeah. it gets more and more. Accepted culturally, yeah, and, and I, 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 want, I should clarify to someone still on camera. <laughs> the, the reason why the reason why I have these opinions is out of compassion and care for those people. Yeah, I, I, I care a lot for them too. Like I, I, I have a, I have a trans friend as well. Uh, he, she, um, yeah, um, uh, uh, love the person to death. Yeah, 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 you know, and so it's all of my opinions come from a place of concern, and it's not concern for like the straight white male. Um, I think we're gonna be fine no matter what. I oh, think oh, oh yeah, because you're because you're a white man, you're gonna be fine. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm I, just I, I, I know. I, I don't, I don't, I don't. That's not what my concern is. My concern is that we're we're we are creating an environment that manif manifests mental illness, and it, it lies to, to it lies mostly to women, and it makes them insanely unhappy. One in four women are on any in, in the U.S. are on any depressants or any anxiety medications. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Uh, the most unhappy demographic of person in the United States by a mile is a woman in her mid-30s without a family, an advanced degree, and a six-figure job. That's by a mile, not even close. So, um, but this ties into my, my other aspect. So before the, before the trans thing really blew up in the last few years, back in like 18, um, I, mean, I, I was more following a lot of like the, the, new, the new feminist stuff that was coming to, coming to the head because feminist, feminism, the feminist movement kind of got a lot of new energy like 15, 16, 17, 18, right? Yeah, following the BLM uh, and then uh, the Me Too movement. Th and that, that was like, yeah, the, the, yeah the, the, the Me Too movement was like, what, 17, 18? Yeah. Um, so I was paying a lot of attention to this stuff and, I was, and I, that's when I first started seeing the, the data on happiness and, and self-reported satisfa life satisfaction. I realized that there, are going to, there is going to be a point where a lot of women, without kids and family, husbands with a career, are going to hit menopause. And they're going to realize they never had a family. They never had a kid. And it's just a biological imperative that every woman feels this pull. Mm -hmm. my, my ex didn't want kids our entire relationship. She wants kids now. She's 31, 30. You know, like. You know, she's in my same friend group, so we still interact. You know, like so. Um, it, it's. I think there's going to be a wave of women hitting menopause, and there's going to be a, a big crisis again. Mm -hmm. And um, I wish that was avoided because it's avoidable. And I, I think there's probably going to be something comparable on the men's side too. I don't know what that looks like, you know. I don't know what that looks like. Um, but I think there's going to be also uh, probably a big crisis for men. Not that there isn't already. We're already seeing, you know, once again, rises in suicide. I mean, not only trans community, but there's suicide among men is going up. Yeah. We already have crisis of drug addiction. We have crisis of homelessness, homelessness. Um, you know, so I don't know what the co comparable, what, what is comparable to men. Maybe maybe I, loneliness. I mean, the men who never get, had a chance, you know, I don't know. I think it is, it's going to come to because men measure themselves with uh, status symbols and, yeah. and accomplishments. And as they go through life, as they not having really chased after anything and made anything really happen, they're gonna yeah, they're gonna I hit forty five so. and realize well hey, I didn't do anything yeah. like like I didn't do anything I, I see it all the time those guys who like suddenly go uh, go out go out of the way and buy a Corvette for some reason you know they try yeah, to like, yeah. bring something back to themselves it's probably gonna be that times ten times twenty where they're like sporadic spending and like juvenile well, ju behavior well, well, well actually we we al we already see like what happens when men who don't know how to properly express themselves out of frustration and, and mental healthness, health, mental healthiness. We, we already see the end result of that, and that's Uvalde, that's the Aurora school shooting, that's Sandy Hook, you know, that's yeah. the Vegas shooter. We've, we've seen what happens yeah. when men don't have a- Are you saying the CIA outlet. wasn't involved in Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's what you're saying, yeah. You know, you know, like, uh, you know it, it, it's, it's violent and it's 
dangerous and people are going to die. So, and so, maybe, so maybe, like, uh, maybe there is real fear around the incel movement then. Maybe there should be real fear around that movement. I don't feel it. I don't see it yet. You have like the Supreme Gentleman, what is, what is his name? The guy who ran around, the sh uh, he shot like the sorority sisters and stuff. I forget his name. Mm -hmm. He's like the first one. He wrote, wrote a manifesto about women. Um, Elliot Rogers. And maybe, 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 maybe that is a, a, a real movement we should be keeping our eyes on. But if we're doing that, we should also be keeping our, keeping our eyes on on like feminist extremism. Like it should be, we should be really covering our bases. I'm not sure if you know about this. Tw I think it was 20 something different uh, pregnancy support centers have been uh, firebombed. Yeah. So like, what, what are we doing about that? Are we, are we, are we really, I'm sure mostly men, I'm, sure, I'm sure mostly male feminists are doing it because male feminists are fucking the most dangerous people on the planet. It's, it's the people in the extremes on both sides. So the, the ones who stormed, yeah. who stormed Capitol Hill on January 6th and they're also yeah. the ones who take over Portland, Oregon yeah, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't even compare those two. I'm, I'm going to show my bias a bit. I think that January 16th is one way out of proportion because there's no guns. Where are the guns? If, if, there's, if, there's real, if there's a real insurrection, where are the guns? The police officer had a gun. Yeah, he did have a gun. He did have a gun. Poor Ashley Babbitt. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're probably on the right track there. I think there's going to be, there, there, it's very possible we should, that, that we should pay attention to, uh, to, to something like uh, a larger incel movement or something along those lines. So, so we haven't seen anything as far as mass shootings yet then by the, by, by the sound of this conversation. Well, the, I think the mass shootings are overrepresented in our culture. I think that they're a big, they're less of an issue than we think they are. I think they're an issue we need to solve. A hundred percent. They're tragic. They're horrible. That's not what I'm saying. But when you look at the numbers, the, there's a lot of other stuff that's going on that's way more deadly, violent towards the same demographic of people, towards children. Yeah. Childhood obesity. Yeah, I think uh, just uh, over in uh, Polk County, just the other day, they they yeah, set child up, traffic is great. Uh, they, they, they set up a sting and they caught like thirteen. Ch uh, uh, guys who thought they were going to meet a 13 year old girl dude he pulls uh, uh, Sheriff Grady pulls like uh, he's got to pull like 60 70 pedophiles a year it's crazy he's just co constant sex trafficking ring busts yeah I mean he's, he's doing a great job I mean that's a hard county too because they, they, there's like there's like trailers buried cooking meth and shit it's a hard hard county Polk, Polk County's I don't go to Polk County I like Polk County I think it's funny <laughs> I think it's funny uh, it's like Lakeland right that's where I like, yeah. like, that's where my mommy used to live my, my stepdad lives out there I've got there but it's just it's you know, it's there are a lot of r very serious threats. So do that you are, that are in, in, but that are easy, easier to solve, dude. Hum humanity's always had problems. Humanity's always had problems. I don't. I don't think these are representative of any sort of like permanent decline. I think that what we what we see is uh, America now and American culture now is going to be very different in the future. I think it's probably not going to be anything remotely like how it is now. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't let the nihilism get to you because that shit is. It's that's the point. That's the point. Um, Yuri Bezmenov, right? You know about Yuri Bezmenov? No. Yeah. Uh, Russian KGB defector from India, a minister of propaganda for, for the Kremlin and, um, and like the Oh, Asian. yes, yes, yes. I, I, he, he went on to colleges, did talks, right? Talked about ideological, subver ideological subversion. Mm -hmm. First one's demoralization, man. That's the first way toxic ideologies and, like, and, uh, and, and really dangerous things enter your head, right? Even, we're talking about the, sh the, the shooters, right? Talking about the, shooters. the reason why they think that way is because they become demoralized. Yeah. So like, don't let yourself be demoralized. There is, it's a, we have, we have, we're dealing with difficult problems that we've never experienced before. Um, but march, the slow march forward is how, is how we win. Mm. That's my opinion. So, so we just keep on focusing on doing good things, building, uh, building good things, and just setting up the uh, proper systems that just help people who want to do good, do good. I think the, f the first way, I think the f I've always, I, I've been a big fan of Peter Jordan Peterson since I first, first yeah. uh, came across him. But he talks about the best way to improve your community is focus on you as an individual. Okay. Like, like just, make, just make sure that, that you're the best person you can be and the strongest person you can be. Make sure that you understand yourself as best as possible. Focus on your own success and well-being. And that bleeds outward because a part of that is giving back and contributing to the people around you. So when you reach a point where you're, you're taking care of yourself with your own personal hygiene, I mean, I'm considering mental health and things you're talking about, hygiene, right? Physical fitness, to me, hygiene. Mm -hmm. when, when, you, if you've, if you, when you get to those to a point where you are healthy enough, that bleeds into people around you. Yes. So um, when the cup is full, it overflows. So Ooh. That, that, <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that's, that's, that's where I think that, that I'm, my, my perspective is, is when I'm, when I'm in a, a be good enough spot or when I'm, when, when I'm in a, at a healthy enough spot, then that's when I can spread out. And I'm, I'm, I, think, I think I'm getting close to being there. I'm getting close to being there. No, that's really cool, actually. Yeah, that, 
Uh, so I manage. So uh, for my company, I, ma I manage the. Uh, uh, I manage all like the sales reps on their dashboards and everything. And every uh, week or so, I post up a new uh, motivational quote. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna use that one. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, <laughs> that do fiasco. Go ahead, yeah. man. Quote, quote Derek Tucker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, no, that's that's awesome, man. No, I I actually really like that. Um, and uh, and 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 this is also one more thing I, I want to get your opinion on before uh, you know we uh transition to whatever we have next. Yeah. Um, it's just something I was think thinking about the other day, which is like the Uvalde shooting. Yes. Right. Um. And, uh, and and I wasn't sure how much of that tied into like everything that we've talked about today. Um, but one thing, uh, but one thing I did start to think about was we spent the last ten years telling police officers to stop being military, to mm -hmm. stop using violence, to stop, uh, you know, uh, to stop engaging, you know, gun first, and stop dealing, stop dealing with aggressive people aggressively. Uh, and we even successfully in twenty twenty defunded a lot of police departments. Yes. You know, so we did. Er so it seems like we did everything in our power to make our police officers as useless as possible. Yeah. And then when a school shooting happens, and then we all the police out. officers do not respond in a way that saves human lives, are we allowed to be uh, pissed at these police officers? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But I, but I think we need to be honest about what happened. Mm -hmm. The people who are, we made it so culturally unpalatable to be a policeman. Yeah. That the people who really gave a shit and wanted to be the good guys were like, I'm out, man. Right, like, so I think what happened was a lot of these departments lost the men who were doing the work because it was good work. Yeah, they said if I'm, if I'm, I'm doing here to to do good, and now you guys are all shitting on me, I'll find some other way to do good. Yeah. So now the people you have are the are the, are the pussies okay. who just want a paycheck. And not every department. I know I I train with a lot of killer killer cops. Amazing yeah. guys. That's a bad phrase. <laughs> <laughs> bad phrase. But I, I train with a lot Canceled. of yeah, I train with a lot of cops who are amazing people. Yeah. Right. And and I and I mean amazing as in like they're running into the fight head first. They they they've personally stopped incidents of of that could turn into extreme violence. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm I mean I'm I'm talking the good people. I mean emotionally ba well balanced, physically trained. Um, they're not out there. They're not out there. Uh, don't don't know how to navigate shit. They, they understand what they're doing when they get into. They, they're they're young, capable. No, they're, yeah. they're capable. Or even strong. the older guys. I mean, I got like a, there's there's one dude who's who's got to be. I didn't ask him his age. He's got to be in his fifties, and he's shredded, yoked, good head on his shoulders, like trains constantly, purple belt grappling. You know, mm -hmm. which is where you want your cops to be because they're not going to hurt someone without intending to hurt them. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I, I ultimately think that a lot of the police the the police forces. Had those types of cops leave? I think Florida's an exception. Yeah. Well, with DeSantis loves police officers. Yeah, yeah. He, he's really yeah, doing he, a great he's job. poured a lot of money into making sure our police officers are c capable people. Now, I'm going to clarify this real quick too. So I, I I lean pretty heavy libertarian with an anarchist bent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I have some beliefs I think that fall into. Like, I, I you could paint me on either side, but I like a, a policeman. Mm -hmm. I think cops and institution are basically the thug arm of the. The state. I think they're basically the, ex the thug extraction arm of the state. You're not wrong. <laughs> so, I mean, if if that wasn't true, we wouldn't have eminent domain laws. Yes. You couldn't just roll up and take people's cash. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if the cops can roll up and just steal your money legally, take all your cash. Oh, you got you got fifteen thousand dollars. I got fifteen thousand uh, dollars. Which is why it's so important for us to just have uh, police officers who are legitimately good people who are not going to do that. And you chase people away when you make it culturally unpalatable to be a cop. Yeah, you, you get situations like Uvalde where the cops don't go in and stop a school shooter, and he's just going to go and kill them. They, 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 they need to be yeah. uh, thrown in jail for uh, negligent homicide, in my opinion. Yeah, I think they're going to go to jail. Absolutely, yeah. But, uh, but but at the same time, I'm just I'm just thinking like, this is what you guys asked for. You guys asked for non-aggressive, for uh, yeah, exactly they non non-militant, underfunded, undertrained police officers. You know, like this is this is what you guys asked for. And I, what I always <laughs> like is that the argument. Well, not you guys, but you know. Yeah, yeah. What I would like is the argument that good, good guys with a gun don't uh, don't stop bad guys with a gun. They go, well, that never happens. Look at all this. Look at the tragedy. Well, the, the tragedy ends because of a good guy with a gun. Yeah. Every single every single mass shooting ever has been stopped by or, or prevented with a, by a good guy with a gun. It, in West Virginia, there was a graduation party just, uh, just oh, yeah, about yeah, a week I heard ago. This. Yeah, I heard yeah, this. yeah. Uh, they were having a party. They started shooting. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uh, this one guy walked over. He was and he was getting loud and belligerent. And they're like, "You need to leave." So he left. He came back with an AK forty seven. Yeah, I saw this. Fully cocked, uh, fully cocked, ready to fire. And a woman shot him. And a woman just uh, uh, pulls out a pistol, goes pop, pop, pop. 
in, and, and down. And, Shut the fuck up. Go to yeah, sleep. Yeah, and and he's dead now. Yeah, go to sleep. You know, and nobody else was killed. Nobody else was hurt. Just the shooter. That happens all the time, and you it's and it's not recorded as any sort of measurable stat, so we don't know that the numbers that it happens in. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also doesn't get, didn't get as much traction. But every single shooting ever, ever was stopped or prevented by a good guy with a gun. That's just how it is. The cops mm-hmm. a good guy with a gun, or some side bystander. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just the way it works. Mm-hmm. And um, and all these these shootings happen in places where you typically wouldn't see guns, anyways. Like you know, you the, the the I think the deadliest one was a graduation what? party. Yeah, or v, v, I mean, v, uh, what was it uh, the Tech Virginia Tech Virginia Tech. That's the most, that was Cho Hui. 30, 33, uh, 33 dead, right? But that's a gun free zone. Like, you know, a child's school, gun-free zone. I, oh, I that was a college. What, what, oh, yeah, that was yeah. a college. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but then you have Uvalde, child's, a, ch- a child's an elementary mm-hmm. school, right? Gun-free zone. And I'm not the type of person to say that uh, teachers with a gun are the best bull stop against shooters. That's not what I'm talking about necessarily. Um, school security, though. I mean, well, school safety officers. Or just, just, I think that, I think that people should be trained, in America, people should be trained with guns almost from, almost from, uh, from, like, I think at like age 10 you'd be shooting. You mm-hmm. could shoot 22. There's just too many guns around that you can't avoid it. And you need to understand what you're talking about. Understand how to navigate a world with many, many guns. Understanding violence just to bring this conversation yeah. full circle. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and those cops don't understand violence. That, that, that's, that's the perfect example of, 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 of what we're talking about. The reason why those cops were so afraid to go in there is because they didn't understand violence. They didn't understand their capacity to solve the problem, first of all, right? Mm-hmm. Using violence to solve a problem is not fun. Most people don't like solving problems with violence. But sometimes. You have to. Yeah. And if, uh, if, if, if someone's trying to, if someone's trying to start to fight with you at a bar, they put their hands on you, you're not going to let that happen. No, you're yeah. going gonna to take them, you're going to take them down, you're going to put them in a rear naked choke, you're going to put them to sleep yeah. in a peaceful way. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, but the, but and, and if you've seen the photos coming out of the, the guys just like standing standing behind like three ballistic. Have you seen them? Yeah. There's photos of like three ballistic shields and it blew my mind. Crazy, crazy. Didn't even check the door. So you have people who don't understand their own capacity for violence. You have people who don't understand the nature of other people doing violence. Mm-hmm. They don't understand. They just, they're just completely ignorant to the situation in front of them as far as the 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 reality of how dangerous, imminent, necessary, all of it. They don't understand that they don't. How, how is a group of like 11 different cops, I think it, was like, it might be 17, I forget the number, but being even in like a group of like six or seven people with one lone shooter in a, in, a, in, a, in a room full of children, and you still don't have the confidence to think that you're gonna solve this problem. Like that, that, that's, that's what I see. I see people who don't understand violence who are the one, people who are responsible for directly, in, involved, directly uh, dealing with violence in our culture. So where do, where do we go from here? We just keep on moving on? Yeah, that's what we have to do. Humanity's had a number of problems throughout, throughout its existence, and, and this is no different. It's just mm-hmm. a new, new brand of problem. Okay. That's the way I look at it. It's just a new brand of problem. It requires new solutions. Um, it sucks we're living through this time. It sucks, it sucks for the people dealing with it, you know? Like, oh. our parents and our grandparents had a great life, <laughs> you know, for the most part. Yeah. At least if they were from the U.S. If they're from, like, you know, oh, well. China, uh, my, my, Russia. No, my, my parents had to deal with Vietnam oh, and yeah, uh, yeah. Great that, Leap Forward fun. and all that fun that, stuff. That's fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cultural Revolution. Yeah, no, they saw some shit. Yeah, they still, at least if you're in the U.S. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you were anywhere else in the world, you are gripping down a hard time. But, but uh, it, you know, and, and people are, I think what's really fascinating, if we're, if we're kind of going to pivot, pivot here a little bit, is that th- those people are actually sounding the alarms in the U.S. right now. Like, there's people who, like, like I have a, I, I have people in my life who I know who are Cuban, Colombian, Venezuelan. Yeah. Even if they're not like as hard, I'm gonna say hard right or as strong on it, they're all like, yeah, we probably shouldn't be doing some of these things, man. Like this is a mistake. Uh, my one buddy is Cuban. He has one uncle who loves Cuba still. He's like, I want to go back to Cuba. I, I, I should never show left. <laughs> You know? there's, there's always going to be an outlier. In yeah, and, but his whole family's like, oh shit. No. And you can see it with my here in Florida, my, Miami voting demographics. Miami flip, flipped red. Yeah, that's insanity. You can see, you know, you talk, I think that oh, this is a kind of a, a random aside, but you look at the immigration crisis. I think that the that the people who are open borders who tend to be very far left, and I think the Democrats are letting it happen because they're in power. That's why they're letting it happen. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm referencing them. They're the ones in power now. Um, is because they think it's gonna give them voters in part, right? They think they're gonna be able to buy voters in some position. Like 100%, that's part of it. Yeah, but most they, immigrants I, that I know are right-leaning. Bingo. They're, 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 right. they're mm-hmm. religious traditionalists, typically. Yeah. And they come from these places, they see what they, they come here because they believe in the American dream. They love America. Like, they're more American than most of these people in our country. Funny how that happens. Yeah, they're more American than most people in the country. Um, 
it, which it, I mean, I would, I, I've been around legal and illegal immigrants my entire life. Yeah, Always. You're from the Northeast. Yeah, and, yes. and well, my, my father's a blue collar worker who drives a truck. Oh, that's as red as it gets. So, you know, um, so, you know, I, I see them. Like, I've interacted with them on a very personal level. I've been to birthday parties, you know, and their children's birthday parties, their houses. And I think it's a very, very large political misplay to think that these people are to come in wanting the American dream. And then you're telling them how shitty America is. And you're gonna, and you're, they're gonna tell them that God isn't real, and that women can become women, and all this other stuff, and and whatever. I, once again, you can do whatever you want with your life. I'm perfectly fine with 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 anybody who wants to make those decisions. Adults, adults, adults. But you can't tell a traditional person from Latin America that's like cool, like it, it's okay, because they they've never encountered anything like that. Mm -hmm. They have never encountered atheism on the scale that we have it here. And I'm an atheist. They never encountered they, they just godlessness and, and like the, the hate on the religious, right? Like, you think? Do you think? Do you think that Latin Americans are like pro, super pro abortion? Do you think, do you think they just like they're used to abortion being everywhere nope. and like in most of the rest of the world? If so you commit an abortion, you go to jail. We you, ha we have the and, Latin and, most and, and if you kill a pregnant woman, that's two double homicide. life sen yeah. sentences. And, and and people like to qu talk about how how progressive Europe is. We have we have looser abortion legislation than than, than Europe does, mm -hmm. for the most part, right? I didn't, probably know, I didn't know that. Yeah, so like I, th so Texas did six weeks, right? Yeah, and I think most of the country is what like 12, 13? What is most? I don't know. I don't know the details of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the, up to the third trimester, essentially, is most of what the the country did. Uh, second trimester. Second, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So up until I think during the second trimester mm -hmm. is what I meant. What I meant. Well, it's, if you, it's, it's uh, when the heartbeat is first detected. Okay, okay. That which happens in the second trimester. Okay, so in, in the UK, it's six weeks. It's like so, like it's I, I'm relative, maybe nine. I'm, I'm almost certain I'm, I'm right on this six mm -hmm. weeks. I could be completely wrong, so fact, please fact check me. But I know for a fact that our national, uh, the national trend on abortion in the United States is actually more lax than Europe. Hmm. So like you look at these things, and it's, I, I don't know. I'm kind of rambling now, but the point is. If we're going to go back to, to kind of like the, the the political play, yeah, I think that that these people, these these immigrants come in, they're gonna they're gonna they're already more assimilated than most of people than most people you see in the blue cities because they they care about hard work. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. Care about hard work. You know, they they thought that the American dream was worth sacrificing for, and I, I disagree with their sacrifice for the most part. I think it's too dangerous. Um, but when you have more. When you have people like that entering the country, and there's large numbers, it's going to affect the culture. And this, and this super kind of this hyper wokeism, it, it won't survive. Especially if you're flooding in three million, four million, five million immigrants a year, it's not going to survive because you're going to these people are going to flood themselves out of the cultural marketplace. Well, we, well, we, well, one of the reasons that we're able, well, why we've been able to uh, do um, the amazing things that we've done as a country is because we have. A huge amount of immigrants just yeah. coming through the border because who's uh, who's going to be willing to do uh, work for like uh, five bucks an hour yeah. under, under the table cash? You or uh, this person who doesn't have their papers together yet? I mean, I would I would argue that I would argue that if we didn't have minimum wage laws and we had stricter immigration, people would do those jobs and yeah. the economy would be healthier. Oh, I'm very against minimum wage. Yeah. I, th I think the minimum think wage should be zero. I, I, it, it, before minimum wage. Um, African American youth were were employed at higher rates than white youth, mm -hmm. and then when they added in wage laws, that's that swap. Yeah, and it's because you priced out people generating skill sets they didn't have before, and they were already obviously because of slavery and Jim Crow, they're already behind the ball. Mm -hmm. So by pricing them out of the marketplace, you basically made it so that you, they, they they couldn't get a, a good footing in the in marketable skills in the, in the job landscape. Um, yeah, you know, so I think inevit inevitably all this negativity ends. I think inevitably solutions arise. I hope the overcorrection is not too extreme. I don't really want like a right wing strong man. I don't really want that. Oh, uh, we just had one. No, Trump was not a right wing strong man. Trump <laughs> was a pussy. Um, I, I voted for Trump. I like Trump, but he made mistakes. He made mistakes, and he he made a lot of mistakes. And he, acting on ego and acting on narcissism the way he did mm -hmm. makes him weak and easily manipulated, which is how like Fauci got him and some other people got him. Mm -hmm. um, that's how that I mean that, that's how Fauci got the 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 the. Uh, the all the funding for for the the experimentations in Wuhan, like you know, he's kind of like, oh yeah, I'll help you, Trump, and mm -hmm. you know, it, so you know, it's I, I don't want to write with strong man. I definitely don't want some geriatric puppet, you know, either. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if we keep, I think that before it settles down, there's going to be there's going to be some extremes that we hit. Um, but I think that inevitably, it all comes to an end.
and then we and then we have new things to uh, to worry about. Yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with our Ray Dalio? And I know I know of him. I know a little bit about him. Okay. Are you familiar with like his uh the his coming new world order no. prophecy? No. Gotcha. What is it? What is it? So uh, so pretty much like he's poured like uh, he's poured like hundreds of millions into like just studying like the fall of, fall of empires uh, you know historically from the, from like the Mongol Empire the Roman Empire the Mesopotamian Empire the Aztecs. breakdown of identity is a big part of that breakdown of identity is one of the big uh, a big breakdown big. of identity and ge- and gender norms has are, are things that has been constant in every, every single, single fall yeah every Mind, single the Mayans and the Aztecs had it as well we don't, we don't know how they disappear but they had it too yeah yeah Greeks as well so. Uh, so, so, so I guess we'll I guess we'll uh, we'll end on that. So, like, what what are, what are your thoughts on that narrative that's being spun by? Well, that that's also a um, I'm forgetting his name, the the Brit, the British guy, Douglas Murray. Yeah, he, I mean, this is something he writes, writes about extensively. Yeah. Um, I think the reason that the breakdown of identity precedes empire collapse is because. It signals. It signals a cultural embracing of relativism, mm-hmm. and I don't think it's necessarily related just to gender or sexuality or any of that stuff. I don't think that's the reason. I think that people lose and have a breakdown identity because of a cultural relativism that's pushed, mm. where you where where we're told that um, there there is no objective uh, good or bad way to live your life, or there is no objective value to things, and. And we can, you can do that, as Nietzsche says, on an individual level and rebuild yourself. As an Ubermensch. As an Ubermensch, right? Like, see, so you, you, you know, uh, oh, great, st- my favorite quotes, oh, great star, what would you be without those for whom you shine? It's mm-hmm. like, first line, like paragraph three of this book, Zarathustra. And what he means by that is, it's multifold. What he means by that is, when you rise from the, uh, when you rise from the fall and you rise from going under um, and you become the Ubermensch, you re, re, Reorient your perspective. That's the sunrise. You, you, you. He uses the sunrise as an analogy for per, for perspective and what he called revaluation, where you re-identify what's valuable to you and you choose your values. That can be God. That's why he said God is dead, right? Because mm-hmm. you can choose to believe in God. You choose to believe in science. You choose to believe in honesty. Um, you choose your own values and your own perspective. So he's a pers- perspectivist, really. Um, so, I think that when you when you have a complete cultural breakdown and you don't have any way to to on an individual level, when people can't, re- in large enough numbers, can't reorient themselves in the world after having these sort of this sort of event where they go under, I think that that creates an atmosphere of of uh, uncertainty, confusion, also all sorts of things. Um, which is why Marxism teaches people teaches everybody to be more relativist because it makes things chaotic and uncertain and mm-hmm. creates creates opportunities for exploitation. Um, so I, I think that the real criminal behind almost everything we're experiencing, and I, I had this conversation with, uh, there's a, a gentleman in our building who is, I think, a youth pastor, I think he said? Sean. Yeah, he's a great dude. Oh, I love that guy. Yeah, great dude. Yeah. So I was talking to him about He makes this. a really good salmon. Does he? Yeah. Yeah, so I have, I, I, I've talked to him once, I took hands with him, um, but, th- but this is something that I mentioned to him. I think that the ultimate cause of all this is moral relativism. I think that by acting as if there is no objective reality, by acting as if uh, words can have fluid meaning, if by acting as if there is no objective good or bad, or there is no right way to live, or no, you know, rejecting biological essentialism, right? Like bio- these sort of things. You break down definitions, and you break down reality. And there's nothing for people to grasp on. They become insane. Yeah. And I think really that's what leads to the fall of empires more than anything else. I think relativism does. Um, even if, even if, let's say that we strip away all of our human perceptions, and we know as some sort of omnipotent being that the whole, that the whole, th- all of it, the human experience itself is relative. Let's say we can strip away the re- everything, all reality, and we're some omnipotent God, and we can know without it, with, with a shadow of a doubt, that moral relativism was uh, the way in which we operate. Mm-hmm. It still doesn't give us any good way to live. No, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's 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 no guidance. There's no direction. But, there's no meaning. You're you're pretty much an existential nihilist at that point. Yeah. The nihilism is the point. The nihilism is the point. They want you hopeless. They want you sick. They want they want you fat. They want you addicted. So, um, the world fears strong people. You know, men and women. The world fears strong people. Um, and I think that's that's especially since we have so many weak people in charge now. I think that the the best thing to do is to to reinforce you as an, yourself as an individual against the hardships of the world around you. And I think the main attack on the individual these days is nihilism. I think they're trying to make you feel hopeless. I think I say they. I think the, I think the, everything is organized in a way that it is. It seems like it's intentionally trying to make people feel hopeless. 
So, so are we uh, headed for a collapse and as an empire, as a nation? I mean, we're probably going to lose our standing as the top of the food chain mm -hmm. for a little while. Um, to China or to someone else? Probably China. Uh. Probably China. And I think at that point, we're probably going to try to be more, we're probably going to have a more author authoritarian push. Because what generally happens is the world will emulate the number one power. Mm -hmm. And they emulate the number one power because they think it'll help them become stronger. Mm -hmm. So if China takes the lead, where the, the, where the world basically goes, oh, that works. Mm -hmm. Oh, that works. You see how strong they are? That works. Let's try that. Yeah. Right. But it's not working right now. Like China's like on the, the brink of the collapse tower. right now. Yeah, for the paper tiger. I don't know much about them. I, I know a little bit. I have a buddy who lived in Taiwan, even though all the riots stuff, he has video footage of all the riots and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and he was telling me the same thing. He's like, look, it, China's got, it's all bark. Yeah. Well, let's, look, let's look at it this way. Uh, who are China's list of allies? Yeah, I, I, think, I think, well, Russia's even tentative. They went out India. I think they're, they're no, they don't trade with India, do they? No, no, no uh, they're enemies with yeah, India. Yeah, bad with India, yeah, no, right? they, they, uh, they, uh, they, they, India have been at war for the last 5,000 years. You used to, uh, remember the fight with rocks at the border over water that one? Yeah. So it was like well, a couple years ago? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so who, again, who are their allies? Yeah. At versus who are, who are our allies? Yeah, pe pe people are, yeah, we have a lot of allies, but I think people are kind of like, people are really a little tired of us. Uh, I, I think up until Ukraine, up until uh, Ukraine happened, um, I would have agreed, agreed with you. Because yeah. One of the things, one of the, the only, one of the good things that came out of Ukraine it wasn't a lot. Um, is that a, is this camera okay? Yeah. Okay. One of the things that came out of Ukraine was that uh, it kind of reminded us that hey, we are a superpower. We can, we have like a lot of missiles and a lot of resources on our side, and we can like mobilize very very quickly because everyone because when Russia first invaded and back in February, everyone was like, oh man, this is going to be a quick, swift, easy, decisive victory for Russia uh, because they remember what happened in Crimea. But then like, what, what we found was, oh man, like, oh man, Russia is struggling. Like, you, don't get me wrong, Ukraine is not coming out of this okay. They are no, going to they, they, they have to give up the Donbass. Mm -hmm. They have to give up the Donbass. Yeah, like, like win or lose, they're, uh, they're going to take, they're going to take, a, they're, they're taking a whole lot of damage. Yeah. But at the same time, you, you, see, you see the wheat numbers, the wheat export numbers? Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> Uh, uh, but 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 at the same time, like uh, because the West was able to mobilize so quickly and start to back Ukraine up, it kind of reminded the entire world, hey, the West is still in control. America and the rest of the EU are still in control. Yeah, yeah, so. and and maybe maybe I'll, look at the ruble's doing really strong right now. I think I think that <laughs> yeah, well, they they pe they pegged the price of gold to oil, and they pegged the price of the dollar, the ruble to gold, mm -hmm. effectively pegging the price of the ruble to oil. Yeah. Which is really fascinating. It's propping it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes to show you how much you can do if you fucking just peg your currency to get something valuable. Yeah. And, that, and they also pulled off like one, a whole like 33% of their uh, the available rubles off the market, thereby limiting the really? supply, which skyrocketed the demand. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. We should Mer do that. Uh, we are, actually. That's good. Like, like, uh, the U.S. government in the past, past few months has been trying to pull off a lot of the money that they printed over the last few years because they rec they know they printed too much. Everyone knows they printed too much. There's, there's, so, there's, there's like billions sitting, sitting in bank accounts that hasn't been yeah. spent. It's already been allocated. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so like one of the uh, one of the ways you do that is you slow down the supply of money and then you get and you get the money back in the form of taxes and 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 and, and, and by making things more expensive. So yeah. when things are more expensive, you pay more taxes. They're, they're trying to absorb all that money back in right now. So America's trying to do the same thing. The whole world is trying to do that right now. So I but actually Russia just did it in a very extreme way because of their situation. I agree with that move. I think we're about a decade too late. I think, oh. uh, that's my that's my opinion. I think the rate should have been getting cranked up for fucking since Obama's. Do, yeah, yeah. The Fed was very clearly was very clearly trying to give Obama a bone. They mm -hmm. should have been raising rates since 08. Since when, as soon as 08 happened. They, they shouldn't. Rate. First of all, all, all the banks should have been in jail. The banks should have been under because they would, all they would have done is fraction and become community banks. It wouldn't have been a disaster. They would, new 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 institutions would have filled the void. Mm, um, there, so are, uh, there are actually a lot of uh, foreign uh, uh, foreign countries that are actually going to try to buy up a lot of the American banks that are about to fraction up. So good. Yeah. Good. I mean, one, one of them was one of them was China. That's scary. Yeah. Uh, T Iceland, they threw a bunch of the politicians in. So Iceland had a crisis around the same time we did in 08. I went to mm -hmm. Iceland a little bit after that. Oh, wow. And um, they had like 60 something weeks of protest. 60 something weeks of protest straight. And I was actually had my hotel in that town center when I was there, so I saw one of the protests. Holy moly. And what they did to fix what, what happened was the politicians. Had, they originally they had a, a public bank, right? So originally it was mm -hmm. government-run bank. They sold the they sold the the bank and they let it go private. So they had people. All of a sudden they were trying to have a private banking system, and then the banks ended up 
because because the kroner license and the kroner was so strong against other currencies because of their like aluminum importation schemes and stuff because they it's so cheap to melt down aluminum there because of geothermal they import aluminum and export it mm -hmm. um, but they never backed up their the 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 markets in the economy by diversifying to other currencies so when the kroner collapsed that's the, the, the other other countries came and said we were trying to get our money back you know they're trying to sell it back some mm -hmm. along those lines right they're doing a bank run yeah okay. bank it was something similar. It was like, I'm, I'm not saying exactly right. I used to have this down pat. Yeah. But what they did to fix it was they relieved um, individual debt up to the owner, up to 125% of the house value that if you own the property. I'm okay with that. Yeah. And the, yeah. And then they threw a bunch of politicians in jail. I'm also okay with that. Yeah. Please. It, it, the problem was solved like two, they, they recovered like a year later, two years later. Yeah. They're, they're granted, they're small. I'm okay with both of those options. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, although I, I uh, make, make uh, politicians uh, afraid again. Yeah, although that's like a that's a uh, self uh, selfish reason. Well, the mortgage one anyway. Yeah, but I would I would definitely have to uh, take uh, uh, take a deeper dive into it, see into that though. Yeah, it's, it's very, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, they handled it completely different than we did, and I, I just I forget exactly what happened. I, I'm, I'm what I what I think happened was that they had sold too much of the kroner, and then when the value started plummeting, banks went to sell the kroner back to them, mm -hmm. and and call in. I just forget how it, how it worked, and it ended up basically just like completely eliminating, like liquidating the entire economy. It was pretty pretty brutal. Interesting. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if all all in all, I'm black but I'm not hopeless. I refuse to be hopeless. I'm not letting the, I'm not letting the world convince me that things are never going to get better. I'm not letting culture scare me to being a little pussy. You know, I'm not. It's, it's just you can't you can't do it, man. You can't cower in a corner. Things are things are always always tr difficult, and there people are going to get through them. I appreciate that, man. That's a very strong mentality you have yeah. there. I mean, re, re, you should resent people. You should resent people who try to break you down. You should be angry that people are attacking you for no reason, and you should be angry when culture tries to tell you um, that your life will never be better. That's just not an acceptable way to live your life. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah man. All right, cool. Uh, anything else you want to say before we uh, close this up? No, nah, man. That's it. Cool. If people want to find out more about you, where can they find it? Uh, Nowhere right now. Oh, leave, yeah, leave a comment. Yeah, yeah, I don't think you're on social media, right? I'm on Instagram. I'm not sharing it yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's mine. We'll follow, we'll follow each other later. Yeah, sure. sure. All right, brother. Cool. Right, so Thank man. you so Thanks, much. Guys. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for doing this. Absolutely, man. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Whew. <coughs> yeah, I ramble. I can ramble a while, man. No, that was really, that was really cool. I, I couldn't get my thoughts.